This is your standard beef carcass. Uh, this animal came into the uh, slaughterhouse weighing at almost 1,300 pounds. He's 1,295 pounds, which in, caused him to throw an 830 pound carcass weight. Typically about 60 to 62 percent of the live weight will go into the uh, cooler. And so what we have missing is obviously the hide, the viscera, the head, and the legs. This carcass has been aging about 21 days. This, uh, this carcass is undergoing dry aging where we let this hang in the cooler for around 14 to 21 days to optimize tenderness. In the industry, typically this carcass would be fabricated within 24 to 48 hours, cut into wholesale cuts, primals and subprimals, put in a vacuum bag, put in a box, and shipped to the local grocery stores. And it takes approximately 20 to 25 days for that whole process to happen. And so that, those carcasses or those cuts undergo wet aging. They, they age inside the vacuum package. Uh, there's benefits and uh, there's drawbacks to both uh, methods. This carcass here being dry age, we're gonna have to cut this uh, dehydrated sections off of the carcass. If it's wet age, you have more of a, a purge loss, a squeezing out of the water inside the muscle. Um, a few things about this carcass. Uh, this region up here is the round. This bulb right off the round is the sirloin. This section right here is the loin, the rib. And down here we have the chuck with the shoulder clod that adds the flare to the, to the uh, chuck. In order to fabricate this carcass, we have to break it in half. And so cattle have 13 ribs. So we're gonna rib between the 12th and 13th rib. And the easiest way to do that is count down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a quarter vertebrae, and we're going to make our cut right there. You can see now we have separated the uh, forequarter from the hindquarter called ribbing between the 12th and 13th ribs. What we have here is the exposure of the ribeye muscle. This will go to make the ribeye as we fabricate this carcass. This is the point where a USDA quality grader will actually assign a quality and yield grade to this carcass. He will observe the amount of marbling in the ribeye and assign a quality grade from the marbling in combination with the maturity of the animal. And this carcass right here is roughly around a small 40, small 50, so he's in the low choice quality grade range. So you can see here we have the forequarter on the block. Uh, a few things to talk about on this forequarter. One of the things you'll notice right off the bat is this thick yellow tendon. This is a, the tendon that holds the head up. It actually spreads itself throughout the, for, the entire forequarter. Uh, this tendon will be removed as we start to fabricate this carcass down into uh, primals and subprimals. Inside this carcass, you notice we have, there should be 12 ribs inside here. Attached here is the diaphragm. This is uh, economically a very high value cut nowadays. This is the muscle that will be cut out and used for fajitas. Uh, years ago, uh, this, this muscle will be, can be purchased for around 99 cents a pound and put into ground beef. Nowadays, due to the popularity of Mexican restaurants and Mexican food, this actual diaphragm has increased in value and it's very difficult to get at the retail level. Now, most restaurants will, uh, will purchase this for making real fajitas. In order to count, separate the chuck from the rib, we're gonna separate the rib from the, between the fifth and sixth ribs, and so we'll have a rib eye and a square cut chuck. You can see we've, we've started our cuts to separate the rib from the square cut chuck. And what we'll end up doing as we cut through here, we'll actually come in and cut through the very tail end of the shoulder blade. And an animal as young as this one is, it'll be just a big piece of cartilage and be easy to cut through. You can see this is the cut surface of the ribeye muscle. This will go to make the wholesale cut, the ribeye. This will go to make the chuck. 
you can see down in here, barely notice the tail end of the scapula, or scapula bone, which is uh, cartilage at this point. As you can see, we have the rib attached, we have the plate. So we'll have to separate the rib from the plate. The first thing we want to do is remove this diaphragm. And it just sits on the ribs, and it's just a simple cut. It's not a very big muscle. As we can see, we can peel the paper or the connective tissue off of the cut. on both sides of it. Now, in these, when these carcasses are dry aged like this, there's, there's a lot of uh, dehydrated surface that we're going to have to cut off of this before we can cut this into retail cuts. Do that. So you see this di dehydrated surface has to come off of here. Cut a little bit of the fat off. Now this is a cut where you can roll it up like so, cut it in half, and you have what is called a pinwheel. And you can get fairly creative with this. You can put cheese in the middle of, as you roll it up. You can put stuffing or whatever you like to put in there to roll it up to make it look more attractive for your customers. The USDA puts out in Institutional Meat Purchasing Specification, or IMPS, which basically are cutting instructions on how we are to fabricate this carcass. And according to IMPS, we have to remove the plate from the ribeye at approximately three inches from the tip of the ribeye muscle to a point that's approximately four inches from the ribeye muscle, which is this muscle right here, on the blade end. This has to be a straight cut. After separation, you see we have what's called the plate and the bone-in ribeye. And for, for the plate, typically what will happen with this, with this cut is we can come in here with a bandsaw and separate. We come here with a bandsaw and make two to three inch cuts with cuts along here, cut between the ribs and display those as bone-in short ribs. However, those aren't very popular nowadays, and what will typically happen with this plate is it will be boned out and put into ground beef. Now, a word of caution for those that are breaking a carcass down, there's a lot of fat in this, uh, in this plate, and so if you're, if you're boning this out for ground beef, you need to be very careful because your fat percentage can creep up on you fairly quickly with the amount of fat that's in this plate. So you may have to lean these plates up in order to produce an 80-20 ground beef or a 70-30 ground beef. What we have now is the whole bone-in ribeye. Uh, you have the ribs coming off of the, uh, of the uh, backbone here. A ribeye should have seven ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven full ribs. And now in order for this to be uh, vacuum bagged and sent out to uh, grocery stores, we have to remove what's called this chine bone here which we'll do on the bandsaw. You can see with the aid of the bandsaw, we removed the chine bone, and we're left with your typical, what's termed a 107 uh, oven prepared rib. As a retailer, you could buy this bone in. However, uh, nowadays the, the trend is towards more boneless cuts. So we'll need to come in here and remove these rib bones. These ribs are just basically laying on top of the muscle. And so the easiest way to do this is use the tip of your knife against the muscle or against the bone and follow the bone 
to remove the entire rib. Through the cut, we've removed the back ribs and we have a boneless ribeye and the back ribs. These will typically be sold as beef baby back ribs. Uh, we typically think of uh, baby back ribs associated with pork. However, we can have those in beef as well. Or we can, we can remove the red meat off the bones and use these for uh, ground beef. We have a, a very rough cut bone, boneless ribeye, which will have to remove this outer part of the ribeye and you can see here in the large end of the ribeye, this is the area that we're going to remove all this above the ribeye. The majority of meat cutting is mainly following the correct seam. And that's what I'm doing here is trying to find this seam on the inside of the muscle. The lip is this region right here. And we're only allowed to have two inches of lip on here. So we're going to have to take some of this off. And we just do that by taking a straight cut, removing the long part of the lip, what we have is a boneless ribeye. We're left with a rough cut, square cut chuck. Now, this region right here is the sternum or the breast part of the animal. We will remove this at the peak of this uh, bone by a straight cut. This cut right here will become the brisket. The shank will remove as well. And inside here, we have the chuck roll that sits in this region right here, as well as on the outer part, this bulge to the shoulder is the shoulder cloth. What is amazing about this is this entire front leg of the animal is held in place by muscle, meaning you go from the front leg all the way up to the shoulder blade, and this, this whole region is not attached to the rest of the skeleton of the carcass. So this is all held in place by muscle. This is the same for all of our major livestock species. Cattle, goats, sheep, and hogs are all, the front legs are all held in place by muscle. And we'll begin by removing the brisket off of the chuck. And as mentioned before, we will come off the peak of the sternum, making a straight cut through the remainder of the ribs. You can see we've made our cut through the chuck to separate the brisket. Basically cutting down to where we hit this natural seam that separates the, sh the foreshank from the brisket and we're going to remove the brisket by cutting along this natural seam. Okay. Here we have the brisket. What we have left on here is the, the uh, part of the sternum and the uh, ribs that are attached to the sternum. This has to be removed. Cut has been made to remove the, the breastplate, and now we're left with a boneless brisket. 
all of this dehydrated portion will have to be trimmed away before this is ready for sale, as well as this big fat pad that sits on top of the muscle will have to be removed. Now we have a brisket that is ready for packaging and sales. Uh, this is a muscle of locomotion. Typically we, we classify muscles of locomotion as being extremely tough. In order to make them tender, we've got to cook them with a moist heat, crock pot, uh, long, slow, uh, low temperature cooking. Now, this is not something I would normally say is conducive to throwing on the grill. However, this is a very popular barbecuing cut. And the way that they cook this to make this tender is they cook it at a, such a low temperature for a long period of time, it allows the collagen, the connective tissue that's inside the muscle to melt away without getting the, uh, the muscle fibers a chance to harden up to make them tough. And so typically, Individuals that are in barbecue competitions will cook this cut 18 plus hours and no more than 200 to 225 degrees. Another thing to notice about this cut, this sternum fat, excuse me, another thing to notice about this cut, this brisket fat on here is very white. It's very hard and white in color. This is indicative of a grain fed animal. Typically, grass-fed animals will have a very soft yellow fat. So you can, you can get a rough idea of the diet of the animal by looking at the, the fat uh, color of the carcass. The brisket can, also, can be sold fresh or it can be sold with a pickling around it to make corned beef. And you will see it sometimes in the store, usually cut in half, and this flat part down here is referred to as a flat portion corned beef or corned brisket, and this point that part that comes to a point is known as the point half of the brisket. And so you will see this either as a flat half or a point half in grocery stores. Most of the time when you see these in grocery stores, they will be in the corned beef uh, variety, having the, uh, the pickling brine inside the package to make this into corned beef. What we have left is of our rough cut chuck is we have the shank portion left on here. The brisket has been removed. Now we're gonna come in here right at this joint where the brisket or where the foreshank turns back towards the uh, brisket and we're, we're going to remove the foreshank in this region. We've removed the foreshank from the, from the square cut chuck. Some of you might be wondering why I didn't follow the cut that was originally made by the brisket. The reason being is I want to lay, make sure that I leave enough muscle on this clod that's sitting underneath here. Okay. The shank is a, also a muscle of locomotion. There's a lot of, of connective tissue through this cut. Typically what will happen with this cut is it will be cut into slices, usually an inch thick or so, and used as a base for beef stock. Now, typically, cross-cut shanks are not a very popular item anymore, and so a lot of individuals will remove the, the muscle from the bone and use this for ground beef. What we have left is an old-fashioned square-cut chuck, where we would start cutting on this end and call these arm roasts, spin it around and start cutting from this end and call these blade bone roast or seven bone roast. And then we would be left with a corner back here that would be fabricated into ground beef. However, the advent of box beef has allowed us to make two distinct cuts from this. The shoulder clod, which the, which the square cut chuck is sitting on, as well as the chuck roll, which is right underneath the backbone and the ribs. The first thing we're going to do is remove the shoulder clod. And we're going to do that by making a cut right along this bone on the cranial side of this bone to a point of the, okay. In order to begin cutting this shoulder clod out, 
we're going to go on the other side of the arm bone. And probably the easiest way to do is to expose the bone and remove this joint inside here. Now there's several ways we can do this. I prefer to remove the remainder of this humerus bone at the joint. We can remove that. And now we can see the joint. We get a better flow of how the shoulder blade works. And a, a very good way of estimating where the medial ridge of the shoulder blade is, is to put your knife in there and you can feel right there we are at the top of the medial ridge. On the other side, you see how the knife will go deeper. We want to be on this side of the medial ridge as we remove the shoulder clot. The shoulder clot is a, it's a very difficult muscle to remove. You come in here and you have to kind of scoop your knife and do a lot of pulling in order to separate the muscle off of the bone. Once you get to the side of the scapula, you kind of go straight down and you'll find a natural seam and the rest of it peels away. So you can see we have our square cut check with the boneless shoulder clod removed. The shoulder clod is the bulge of the shoulder on the outer part of the animal. Underneath you have what we call the subcutaneous fat, which is the layer of fat that lays directly underneath the hide. This, for the longest time, this was rode off as a very tough cut as it was a muscle of locomotion. However, uh, the muscle profiling study, which was funded by the beef checkoff dollars, where the individuals went in here and they dissected each and every muscle off of the carcass, ran a series of tests on those muscles. One of those tests that they run is what we call a warner Braxler shear force test, which is a measure of tenderness. And we noticed that this muscle right in here, as well as this muscle that lays on top, were very tender muscles. And so we have removed these muscles and marketed them in ways that, that enhances their tenderness. And so this muscle right here typically will be removed in the old days, cut into stakes and called a top blade stake or a leaf stake. However, if we come right in here in the natural seam, we can remove this muscle. We clean the back part up. Now, the challenge of this muscle is right in the middle, there is a vein of connective tissue. You can see this vein of connective tissue here. This poses some tenderness problems. And so in order to enhance and take advantage of the tenderness of the muscles below, above and below this vein of connective tissue, we've come in here and we've cut the muscle away from the top of this vein. Then we come in here and remove the vein of connective tissue itself from the bottom part of this muscle. So now we have the top part of the muscle and the bottom part of the muscle. Do that again since you probably caught that spit that went everywhere. <laughs> okay. Now we have the top part of that muscle and the bottom part of that muscle. And as you can kind of tell from the shape, it's taken on a different appearance to it. The shape kind of looks like the bottom part of an iron. And so therefore, the, the beef industry has named these cuts the flat iron steak. And so typically what you'll see is these guys cut in half or cut to certain portion sizes. 
Vacuum packaging sold as flat iron steaks. Very tender cut, it's gaining in popularity. You, you can find it in several grocery stores now, as well as you can find it in several restaurants. After the flat iron steak has been removed, there's a very important muscle that sits on top of here. It's called, the, the actual name of the muscle is called the teres major. And it just sits in there at a natural seam, which we're going to remove. Now this is a fairly tender cut of beef. And so we have removed not only the flat iron steak, but we've also removed this muscle as well and mark it its tenderness. And so this is kind of, a, of an odd shaped uh, a muscle, but we can come in here with our knife and face this up and cut it like we would a filet mignon and call these either petite shoulder tenders or petite tender medallions. The remainder of the clod, what we'll do is we can remove some of these accessory muscles here. Basically, we're just following some natural seams. And we'll use this portion as ground beef. And what we have now which a lot of retailers are familiar with. This is commonly referred to as the, the clod heart or the shoulder clod heart, which we can cut this up into steaks or we can cut it up into roasts. The remaining part of the square cut chuck that's left over has two important muscles in here that we, uh, we can mark it. On the other side of this medial ridge of the shoulder blade, is a long round muscle that we can pull out, which we'll, we'll call the chuck tender or the scotch tender or the chuck mock tender. And you'll see why it's called the mock tender as we pull it out. So you can see the chuck tender, we followed this fat seam to get down to it made a cut on the other side of the medial ridge and followed that around, and we can remove this chuck tender. You can see this is kind of a, a long pencil-shaped muscle. Now the reason why it's called the mock tender is I could come in here and I can cut this like I would a filet mignon, and it has a very similar look as the filet mignon. Now the challenge of this is, that this is a muscle of locomotion. This muscle is very tough, whereas those muscles on the other side of the medial ridge, the, the uh, flat iron stake and the shoulder tender medallions are very tender cuts. This, on the other hand, is a muscle that gets used quite often. And so the, you can see how it gets its name as the beef chuck mock tenderloin. After the chuck tender has been removed, we can now easily remove this shoulder blade. And as I mentioned before, this shoulder blade from this joint goes to the front foot. The rest of this, this shoulder blade is not attached to the rest of the skeleton. You can see on this side, the remaining part of the skeleton. You know, here's your rib bones right in here. You can see meat between the rib and the shoulder blade. Therefore, we can go in here and we can remove this shoulder blade and not have to cut through any bone at all. Basically, with the shoulder blade removal, we just came right underneath the blade bone and removed it. As such, we can take the remaining meat off of here and put in the ground beef. What we have left is a rough cut chuck roll. The chuck roll sits in this region right here. However, we have the remaining part of the ribs and backbone, which will need to, need to be removed. The rib bones and the neck bones are removed by basically following the bone and removing the remaining bone in part. We can come in here and dig the meat out of here and put in the ground beef, which is ideal. It is a lot of labor involved in this. What we have remaining now 
is typically what would used to be called a two-piece chuck. This would be vacuum packaged and sold with the whole shoulder clod, referred to as, as a two-piece chuck. However, in order to make a chuck roll, we'll come in here a few inches off of what was the uh, ribeye, follow that cut all the way back, remove this, use this for ground beef. After cleaning the, uh, the two, what was the two piece chuck, after cleaning it up, we're left with the chuck roll. Now, an interesting thing about the chuck roll, The ribeye, make sure you try it the ribeye set in this region in reference to the, to the chuck roll. So we made a cut between the fifth and sixth ribs. So we still have a portion of the ribeye muscle in this region right here. And so what a lot of retailers will do to take advantage of the tenderness of the, the remaining part of the ribeye, they will come in about three or four inches cut this portion off and so you're left with let's get this around here you're left with a piece that looks very similar to the ribeye and so we can come in here and roll this remaining part of the ribeye muscle out So what you have is something that looks very similar to a ribeye. And so what we can do now is we can cut this into steaks. Once these are cut into steaks, they're often referred to as chuck eye steaks. Now, you also see these referred to as a poor man's ribeye, as this will retail for around $13 to $14 a pound. I can purchase these chuck eye steaks, or sometimes referred to as poor man ribeyes, for roughly around $3 or $4 a pound, and they are just as flavorful and tender as the higher price cuts. Now, another name you'll often see these referred to as is Delmonico's. And so chuck eye, poor man ribeye, or Delmonico is another way that these steaks can be marketed. The remaining portion of this chuck roll typically will be cut into steaks or roasts. However, recently the, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has decided to really go and market this chuck eye muscle in here. And so what they are doing is removing this muscle at its natural seam. <coughs> Maybe. So they're removing the chuck eye muscle at the natural seam, and so we're left with the chuck eye muscle and the remaining portion of the chuck roll. Now, the challenge we have with this, this roast is, as we cut the steaks further towards the, uh, the head of the animal, they don't look as appealing. However, we can wrap this whole piece in butcher twine, or we can put it in jet net, and market that as a, what is often now referred to as an American roast, which would be an ideal um, alternative to prime rib. The other portion that is left can be marketed in a couple of ways. We can season this and roast it and sell it as a carver roast in our delis, 
or we can make individual slices and sell them as boneless short ribs, or they're often referred to now as the Denver cut. Here we have the hind quarter. We have the rear leg, referred to as the round. This region here is the sirloin, and what we have left is the short loin, or the, we could leave the loin attached and have a full loin. Now, we also have in here, we also have right here the flank, which right up here in this region, which you'll see shortly, is where the, the retail cut, the flank, comes from. We'll begin fabricating this carcass by removing the flank. And this is made by a cut that comes along the side of the top part of the round. It's always a good idea to remove this connective tissue on the outside to get a better look at the muscle. You now see, after removing this connected tissue, you get a better look for the outline of this teardrop shaped muscle. And to finish removing it, we will clean the remaining part of the fat up. And we actually just come in underneath it. That easier to see now. Okay. So basically, coming in underneath the muscle, we can remove the flank stake. The remaining portion that's left has a lot of fat with a little bit of lean left in here. We can take the lean out and use that for ground beef and throw the fat into rendering. There we have the flank stake, cleaned up and ready for retail sales. You'll often refer, see this referred to as a Swiss steak or the London broil. However, Swiss steak and London broil are recipes and not necessarily a particular cut. So you will often see it displayed in retail flat like this, or we can score it by making light cuts across the surface. And rolling it so we highlight the scores. We're going to separate the round from the full loin by coming about two fingers width off the top of this H bone and hitting the last two vertebrae on the uh, left of the spinal column. And if we do this correctly, We remove the full loin from the round. Now ideally, we could have come back and cut the head of the femur back in this region right here, and you've got the top of the, uh, the, the ball joint of the femur, often referred to as the butcher's dollar. Uh, we didn't do a very good job and we missed the top of the femur. The story behind the butcher's dollar, in, in, the, in the old days, meat cutters were paid on the number of carcasses they broke down in a day, versus the way they're paid now is by an hourly wage. And so at the butcher's dollar, the legend goes that a meat cutter would collect those femur heads, put them in his pocket, and at the end of the day, he would go to get paid, he would pull out those femur heads 
and show them to the accountant to show how many carcasses he broke down that day. Judging by the way we cut this, we wouldn't get paid for this one. <laughs> Here we have the steamship round. You'll often see this setting at the end of a long buffet line at a Sunday dinner. And what typically would happen is this, this whole piece would be cooked for 24 to 28 hours to make it tender at a very low temperature. This is a muscle of locomotion, so we have to be very careful of how we cook this piece of meat. And so you can see this at the end of the buffet line, a very majestic looking piece setting there. As a patron in the restaurant would come in and they would want something that was medium rare, the server at the end of the buffet line that was serving the steamship round could cut a piece down here at the bottom that didn't get cooked as much as that would got cooked more fully at the top part of the round. So a patron who wanted something that was well done could get a piece of meat up here. Those patrons that wanted something more of a medium rare category or a rare could get a piece of meat down at the bottom. Now to begin fabricating this round, we need to come in here and we need to remove this H bone. Now this bone right here is one half of the pelvic girdle. Remember there's another half to this carcass. And he sets in there in kind of a C shape. And so we'll just take our knife and we'll come in around him and remove the H bone. All right, we've, we've removed the H bone. You can see the head of the femur. You can see the joint as well. Now, a word of caution. This is a very difficult uh, bone to remove. There's been a lot of meat cutters that have cut themselves badly as you typically you're cutting towards your body. And if you don't have any steel mail uh, protecting your, your chest and your belly, there's been a lot of meat cutters that have been cut badly by removing this bone. So please be very careful as you remove this bone. And what we have in the face of the round, okay, this region right here is the knuckle or the tip. Now some of you that are watching this that have a little bit of experience in fabricating carcasses are probably wondering why I didn't remove the knuckle while the, the, the hindquarter was hanging. Uh, I prefer to remove the, uh, the tip when it's on the table as if, if, if the carcass is hanging, you have a greater chance of cutting yourself. And so in order to remove that, clean fat off of here. All right, you see the ball of the femur. We're gonna remove the knuckle by coming on the other side of that, making a straight cut all the way back. Bearing in mind, we wanna be really close to that femur bone. Now we move this knuckle, we follow the femur bone. Now, a thing you gotta remember, typically what will happen is people just make a straight cut all the way to the block top and forget that the actual knuckle kind of curls underneath the femur bone. If you're cutting a carcass up for profit, you need to leave as much of that knuckle on there as you can. And so ideally you come in back underneath this bone, find this natural seam and peel the knuckle out from there. This is what would often be referred to as a rough cut cap on knuckle. It has this portion on here which is called the cap, obviously, and so we could sell it like this. Now, typically what we have to do is we have to remove this bone, which is the kneecap. It's a fairly easy bone to remove. The kneecap is removed. Now we can come in here and follow this natural seam and remove the cap. So by following the natural seam, we can remove the cap. We have a cap off tip stay, our cap off tip, clean this up, which you will often see vacuum bagged and bought at wholesale. We have left on here the shank, which we'll have to remove. 
And basically, we're going to see this. You see this natural joint in here. This is where we're going to remove the shank. Shank has been removed. This is kind of a tricky joint to go through. You can see it has a lot of peaks and valleys. You just have to be kind of patient. Pushing down on the back of the shank to expose that, that joint will help you get your knife through there a lot easier. The remaining portion that we have left is a bone in round. Now, you can purchase these for retail like this, or we can have the femur bone removed and, and purchase a boneless round. Now, the thing to remember with this cut, there is the top round, the bottom round, which the, the piece is setting on, and over along this side, this region right here is the eye of round, which will actually go ahead and, and separate those muscles for you. We removed the femur bone, and then we've come in here and found the natural seam and removed the top round, top round from what is often referred to as the gooseneck. Okay, so this top round, this top round can be cleaned up, removing the dehydrated portions of that, and go to a grocery store as is and be cut into top round steaks and top round roasts. The gooseneck contains two portions. This area right here is the eye, the eye of the round, as well as the bottom round. We also have part of the heel left on here as well. In order to separate the eye from the bottom round, we will remove the the heel. There's a natural seam to remove the heel. Remove the heel, which the he heel contains a lot of connective tissue, a lot of heavy connective tissue in that. The best thing for this is to go into ground beef. We have followed the seam. Now this is a very tight seam, and so you kind of have to eyeball removing the eye of round from the bottom round. The eye of round can be trimmed up, removing the heavy fat and dehydrated tissue. This can be vacuum packaged and sold at retail, and then typically a, a retail meat cutter will come in here, square the front off, and cut eye of round steaks. So you have eye of round steaks as well as leaving the rest whole for a eye of round roast. What we have left is a very rough cut bottom rim. We need to clean this up, removing a lot of the heavy fat, a lot of the excess muscle that's on here. And this can typically be done by following many of the natural seams. So we have a whole bottom round, or what's often referred to as a round flat. Now the name of this muscle is actually called the biceps femoris. A biceps meaning it has two, two heads to the muscle. Femoris means it runs right along the side of the femur bone. Now as you can see in this region right here where this heavy seam is, this is the other head of the muscle. Now what we can do in retail, we can cut the end of this muscle to make a nice roast once it's trimmed up. Now typically what would happen, once that roast was cut off of there, a retail meat cutter would come in here and just make regular straight steak cuts perpendicular to the flow of the muscle. However, as you notice, you can see the grain is running at an angle. We know that this is going to be a tough cut of meat, and we know if we cut across the grain, we can make this cut a little bit more tender. So what we can do now is come in here right where this 
this uh, other muscle head is, remove it at that seam, and put this off to the side, cut the seam out of there because that is heavy connective tissue and it, it will be very tough. Now, As you can see, the muscle fibers are running at an angle. So in order to give ourselves a chance to make this as tender as we can, we're going to cut across the muscle fibers. By cutting across the muscle fiber grain, we give our, our steaks a little bit different look as well as we give a greater chance of uh, making the steak a, a little bit more tender than it normally would be by typically cutting it straight uh, at a diagonal according to the way the, the muscle fibers grow. The remaining portion of this, this muscle can be left whole as a roast or we can actually cut that in steaks as well. As you can see, the, the muscle grain flows perpendicular and so we just cut straight across the, the grain. This typically, this half is typically more tough than the other half. The remaining portion we have is the full loin. We have the sirloin portion and the short loin portion. Now you see this heavy fat on here. This fat is a very dry fat. It's, a, it's actually the first layer of fat laid down in the animal's body. It surrounds the organs to protect them. Uh, the big bulb of uh, a fat that was down here contained the kidney, therefore this was often referred to as the kidney fat. Now, this may not mean much, but typically you will see this if it is marketed as suet. This is your suet right here. Uh, it's a very dry, crumbly fat, and we will remove it and throw it off to the side. So, Now, a, a common question is asked, why do we leave that large amount of kidney fat on there? The main reason why we leave that large kidney fat chunk on there is this muscle that sits right underneath this. This muscle goes from the, from the head of the, uh, excuse me, let me start all over again, okay? A common question that is asked is why do we leave that big amount of kidney fat on the carcass? The main reason we leave that kidney fat on there is to protect this muscle that lies directly underneath it from dehydration. This muscle starts here at the pelvic bone and goes all the way down to where the 13th rib is. This is a very expensive muscle. This is the muscle where we would get our filet mignons, the, tender, the beef tenderloin. Now, there's several options we have here. We have our sirloin, our loin, and our tenderloin. Now, if I was going to make all these boneless, I would remove this tenderloin, remove the sirloin and have a boneless loin or boneless top loin that I could cut into New York strips or Kansas City strips depending on the region of the country you are from and still have the remaining portion of this tenderloin as I sell as a full tenderloin to, uh, to my, my customers. However, if I want to leave this as a short loin, which we are going to do, we will, we will miss the opportunity having a full tenderloin will be left with what is called the butt tender down here. Now, in order to remove the sirloin from the loin, we are going to cut right here in the middle of the very last lumbar vertebrae. Okay. By cutting in the middle of the last, of last lumbar vertebrae, we remove the sirloin, we have a bone-in sirloin, and we're left with a short loin. This is where we're going to get our porterhouse steaks, and our T-bone steaks. As we cut the, uh, the short loin into steaks, we're left with two types of steaks. We're left with the porterhouse and the T-bone steak. Now often these, these two are confused, however, they are very different cuts. Now, what makes a porterhouse a porterhouse versus a T-bone a T-bone is two things. Number one, the porterhouse is gonna have a much larger tenderloin versus the T-bone steak, as well as if you notice this muscle right here, this is actually the tail end of the sirloin muscle, often referred to as the jump muscle. 
This needs to be present on the porterhouse to be called a porterhouse steak. Otherwise, you have a T-bone. What is unique about the porterhouse and the T-bone is you're essentially getting two steaks in one. If we were to remove the bone and remove this portion right here, we would have a top loin steak or a New York strip steak or a Kansas City strip steak, like I said, depending on the region you are from, as well as a tenderloin steak or a filet mignon. So if you order a T-bone or a porterhouse, mainly the porterhouse, you will get two steaks in one cut. We have now is the bone-in sirloin. Now we can cut this into steaks and we get things called round bone, flat bone, pin bone and wedge bone sirloin steaks. However, the trend has gone away from bone to a boneless steak. And so what we have remaining in here, this muscle right here is the tenderloin muscle, which we can pull this out. So we can remove the tenderloin muscle and we have, as we clean it up, we have what's called a butt tender. Now to a retailer, he will pay a little bit more money for this butt tender as it is basically steak ready. It's gonna be the same thickness from one end to the other, whereas a full tenderloin, not only is it longer, but the full tenderloin will actually decrease in size and become flatter as it gets more towards the, the head of the animal. Now, what we have left is the sirloin with the, with the uh, hip bone in, in uh, excuse me. What we have left is the sirloin with the hip bone still attached where we need to move the hip bone to get to the top sirloin, which is this region right here. So removing the hip bone, just take this guy off. Now this is also a somewhat difficult bone to remove, so make sure you're, you're extremely careful as you do that. And so we're left with the top sirloin and the bottom sirloin. There is a natural seam between the two cuts that we will utilize to separate the top from the bottom sirloin. So here we have the top sirloin which we can cut into sirloin steaks, or we have the bottom sirloin. Now typically, this is actually the head of that tip or knuckle muscle that we removed earlier. And so you'll actually see people remove this at the natural seam and sell that as a ball tip steak. The remaining portion we have left under here is a very popular cut in California and, and has gained a little bit of popularity throughout the Midwest and the Southeast. It is often referred to as the tri-tip steak. So with the sirloin, we have the top sirloin, with the bottom sirloin, the little, little head of the muscle that's left on there from the knuckle, they can cut that off and call that a ball tip. And then the remaining portion that's left underneath the bottom sirloin is the tri-tip. Not to be confused with this portion, of the top sirloin, which is actually the continuance of the bottom round muscle. But this is actually the true tri-tip steak. What you've witnessed is a basic fabrication of a whole side of beef. There are very many ways of doing this. This is just the, the method that I'm the most comfortable with. A lot of individuals like to fabricate from the rail. Others, like myself, like to do it from the block top. Now, as a consumer, some things to think about when buying beef. Uh, Marbling, which is the, the amount of fat, the flex of fat inside the muscle, is good. The more marbling we have, the more flavorful, the more juicy this piece of meat is going to be. And so you hear terms like USDA Prime and USDA Choice, which are our top two cuts of beef, which have the most amount of marbling, Prime having more marbling than Choice. Typically what you'll see in a lot of grocery stores now is USDA Select, which is a grade below choice. Also, the vast majority of our carcasses, our beef that's fabricated in this country, is fabricated somewhere around 16 to 18 months of age. Those animals at that age will grow up to be roughly 1,200 to 1,300 pounds. The reason we, we harvest those animals at that age, younger animals will typically be more tender than older animals. Marbling has very little, if nothing, to do with tenderness. This doesn't necessarily mean that something that is heavily marbled is going to be more tender. Now, 
from that animal that was almost 1,300 pounds when it came in the door and had an 830 pound carcass weight, we roughly got close to 350 to 400 pounds of boneless beef out of those cuts. You can typically view a carcass or a whole animal and, and estimate roughly 30 to 35 percent of that live weight is going to go home to your freezer. Once it gets to the car or once it gets to the carcass state, the, the bones inside that carcass will ref, roughly be around 20 percent of the carcass weight, as well as the fat that we have to trim off will desperately decrease the amount of, of retail cuts that we take home. And so if you have any questions, feel free please feel free to contact me. My name is Greg Renfro. I'm a PhD. I'm the Extension Meat Specialist at the University of Kentucky. My number is 859-257-7550. Thank you.